Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. Let's do this. Hello, and welcome to the latest episode of Masters of Carpentry, the John Carpenter podcast, where we discuss all things Carpenter and Carpenter-esque. I am joined today by my co-hosts, Julia. Hi. Noel. Hello. And very special guest, Kevin. Yeah, you're not getting when you said latest. It's nearly nine o'clock over here. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> we can do it another time if you want, Kevin. No, I'm here. Let's do this. All right. John Carpenter's Stroke in the Midnight Hour. That's right. That sounds like it actually could be a John Carpenter movie. John Carpenter's The Midnight Hour. Absolutely. I'd watch that. We are here to discuss, I think this has been one of the most highly anticipated episodes, for at least some of us. I know, I've been. We are here to discuss Big Trouble in Little China. The 1980s classic? We'll be the judge of that. We'll be the judge of that. And I know it's a film that I think we all have seen before. Mm -hmm. Yes. Do we want to just go a little around what is our past history with this movie? There is no beginning or end with Big Trouble in Little China. I don't remember the first time I watched it. I'm sure it was on television. I'm sure it was late night. I'm sure I was babysitting. That's usually when I saw most of these movies. It's always been there with me. And yeah, it's just one of those movies that you just, ah, oh, Big Trouble in Little China. I'm going to watch the hell out of this right now. It kind of finds you in the right place at the right time. And I won't say too much more. This is the third time Alex has made me watch Big Trouble in Little China. Emphasis on made. <laughs> yes. I did not know anything about it before Alex shared it with me. Emphasis now on shared. Well, that's really the best way to get into it. <laughs> I mean, you can't really be prepared for this movie. No. You've got to be blindsided by it like all the rest of us was. you just got to drive your truck straight in that alley. That's right. It's sort of, I guess, semi-interesting on my part because it's one of my parents' favorite mainstays of the uh, horrible movie parties that they used to do. This and The Head That Wouldn't Die were <laughs> their most favorite fallbacks for the horrible movie party. So I saw this, I want to say, 10, maybe 12 years ago. And then I haven't seen it again until last night. The experience was exactly the same. You don't really get that with movies that you watched as a kid and then watch again as an adult because usually you're seeing it with different eyes. You see it with knowing things that you didn't really know back then and that either makes the movie better or worse in your opinion. And for me, it was exactly the same. And I know I saw at least part of this when I was a child because there are specific images in it that gave me really bad nightmares. And then I don't think I saw it again until it came out on DVD in like 2001 or so. Ever since then, I've probably watched it about a dozen times. Ever since starting Masters of Carpentry, I have avoided watching all of Carpenter's movies just because I kind of wanted to get to them when we get to them. With the exception of this, I've watched this film four times before watching it for this project in the last year. It's always on TV. I know I practically begged to be on this episode with you guys. <laughs> oh, yeah. This is the first and only film John made for 20th Century Fox. The budget was around $20 million, but it only pulled in a total domestic gross of just over $11 million. Sadly, also kind of tanked with critics, too, who really tore into it as a stupid and awful movie. It debuted at number 12 at the box office, behind Ferris Bueller's Day Off, Running Scared, Legal Eagles, Top Gun, Back to School, Ruthless People, and Karate Kid 2, all of which were already several weeks into their releases. And it was also beaten by the debuts of Psycho 3 and The Great Mouse Detective. It surprisingly held its position for a second week and then completely dropped out of the listings because Aliens came out. And everything dropped because of Aliens. Yeah, that would do it. Oh yeah. The film was directed by John Carpenter, who also composed the score, his fifth with fellow composer Alan Howarth. The film also features several songs by the Coup de Villes, John's band with his old friends and fellow directors Nick Castle and Tommy Lee Wallace, who had all just reformed and put out an album. And this did of course come with an obligatory music video, which I believe I tweeted earlier today, and will include in the production notes for the episode. <laughs> A quick side note, after floundering following his directorial debut, Halloween 3 Season of the Witch, Tommy Lee Wallace rejoined Carpenter here as Big Trouble's second unit director. 
This is the fourth of five John Carpenter movies starring Kurt Russell. It'll be another decade before they reunite for their final one, Escape from L.A. Kurt was the first to get attached to Big Trouble, and he was the one who brought it to Carpenter. The script began as a period western spec by Gary Goldman and David Z. Weinstein. I can't find any further info on Weinstein other than he was the story editor on a short-lived 2001 fantasy sitcom called Dead Last. Gary Goldman has gone on to become one of my favorite writers to read, working on Total Recall, Navy Seals, Next, and unproduced drafts of Minority Report, Watchmen, and X-Men. And seriously, out of all the Watchmen drafts, his is actually my favorite. I love it. It's worth tracking down. The script was shifted into the present-day setting by screenwriter W.D. Richter, fresh off of his directorial debut with The Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai Across the Eighth Dimension. He also directed Late for Dinner, and his other screenwriting credits include Peeper, Nickelodeon, The 1978 Invasion of the Body Snatchers, The Frank Langella Dracula, Brubaker, All Night Long, Hard Feelings, Needful Things, Home for the Holidays, and Stealth. Richter stayed involved with the script well into production, only leaving when he and Carpenter clashed over the casting of Kim Cattrall. Richter and Carpenter also happened to have been classmates at USC back in the early 70s, but that's unrelated to them working together here. And Richter also wrote a draft of the unproduced film The Ninja, which Carpenter and Tommy Lee Wallace later rewrote with the hopes of Carpenter directing, which is something I will be covering in a future episode. This is the fifth film Larry Franco produced for John Carpenter following Escape from New York, The Thing, Christine, and Starman. He continues to also serve as first assistant director, which he also did on all three of those along with Elvis and the Fog. Executive producer Keith Barish, who also made the film under his production company Taft Entertainment, also worked on the likes of Sophie's Choice, Nine and a Half Weeks, The Monster Squad, Running Man, Serpent in the Rainbow, The Fugitive, and U.S. Marshals. Executive producer Paul Monash wrote a ton of cop shows in the 60s, then the 1979 miniseries for Salem's Lot. His other film productions include Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, Slaughterhouse Five, The Front Page, Carrie, and The Rage Carrie 2. And after sitting out John's last two films, cinematographer Dean Cundy finally returned for his seventh and final film with Carpenter. His credits ever since they broke up include Who Framed Roger Rabbit, Roadhouse, The Back to the Future Trilogy, Hook, Death Becomes Her, Jurassic Park, Apollo 13, The Parent Trap, Looney Tunes Back in Action, Garfield, and Jack and Jill. As well as his directorial debut, Honey, We Shrunk Ourselves. So this is the second film for script supervisor Sandy King, whom John would marry in four years. And this is the ninth John Carpenter film for boom operator Joe Brennan. Jack Burton is a trucker hauling a load of pigs to Chinatown. While gambling over some beers, he wins a heap of money off a of fellow trucker, Wang Chi. Wang can't pay, so Jack tails him to the airport where Wang is set to pick up his bride, Miao Yin, only to watch as she's kidnapped by goons working for the gang, the Wing Kongs. Jack and Wang race to pursue, but they're halted by a full-on alley war as the Wing Kong set upon their rivals, the Chang Sing, with the help of three demonically enhanced warriors, the Three Storms, Thunder, Lightning, and Rain. Jack and Wang get away, though not without losing Jack's truck, and regroup at a Chang Sung-affiliated cafe. This is where we meet Gracie Law, a Chinese-born activist working with a reporter to reveal the underground trafficking ring run by local crime lord David Lo Pan. Wizen sorcerer and tour bus driver Egg Shen also shows up, revealing Lo Pan is a 2,000-year-old wizard, cursed by a demon to live only in spectral form, who intends to break this curse by marrying and sacrificing Miao Yin due to her green eyes. The whole gang of heroes breaks into Lo Pan's palace-slash-tower, where it's a maze of chambers and crypts and chutes and hidden tunnels modeled after the Chinese levels of hell. They fight monsters, Wing Kong warriors, the various three storms, freeing various prisoners along the way. Gracie is captured at one point, and due to being Chinese-born and having green eyes, Lo Pan decides to marry her too, so he only has to kill one wife and can keep the other for himself. A big fight breaks out with Lo Pan taking on the sorcery of Egg Shen, then ultimately falling to a lucky toss of Jack's knife. Everybody flees and people inflate, monsters continue to appear, and Jack finally finds his truck again. As the dust clears, Wang and Miao Yin are in love, Gracie goes back to her activism, and Jack rides off on another haul. I think that's the movie. That's definitely something that sounds like what I watch. <laughs> yes, it's easy to breeze over and then a lot of stuff happens. So, Alex, do you recommend this movie? Yes, I feel like I'm walking into a minefield, but I do. It has issues, mostly with cultural insensitivity, as does Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. I could see what they were going for by doing the mysticism through a pulp take on it, but that still boils down to not respecting another person's culture, no matter which way you slice it. Other than that, it is a blast, and it's super fun, and I love it. Julia? 
So this is, as I said, the third time I have watched this movie under duress. And this is the only time I have genuinely enjoyed it. Oh. I did not expect to. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I was doing my duty. (laughs) Creeps up on you. And I've always kind of, I'm sure it's probably inappropriate in itself, but the movie is so inappropriate, I don't think it matters. Described this as being a boy movie, which is a broad generalization, I know, but it for some reason has a strong appeal towards men and all of the girls I've ever spoken to do not dig it. So I always referred to it as being a boy movie and that I just didn't get it and blah, blah, blah. And then I started watching it again. And yep, same feeling. Uh, About 10 minutes in, I was like, ugh. (laughs) And then Alex said something to me that completely changed the way that I saw the whole movie. I can't remember exactly what you said, but you basically described what it was doing. You were saying how silly it was, how it was like a take on like a madcap caper, that it was like a noir, that it was this sort of thing. And then it actually turned something on in my brain where I was actually able to switch and watch it from that perspective. And I don't know why I never was able to do that before, but I was this time and it became thoroughly enjoyable because I just stopped taking it so seriously. Not that it was ever a serious movie, but I was always like, ugh, this is stupid. (laughs) (laughs) But it is really stupid. And everyone who's making the movie knows that it's really stupid. And once you know that they're in on the joke, then all of a sudden it's brilliant. (laughs) Kevin? This is basically John Wayne's surprisingly excellent adventure through racism. Uh, (laughs) I love it for all the reasons that Julia said that she finally decided to love it, because it is so just... Yeah, we can talk about the blatant racist everything, and we probably will in a little bit, but it's so played up, especially since I recently also watched a classic of schlock kung fu theater, Jet Li's The Legend, which is (laughs) brilliant and also completely silly. The best way that that kind of stuff is. You had Kurt Russell, who found himself in the wrong movie and went with it and then left. You had John Wayne going through a Western, and it turned out to be a kung fu movie, and he was like, you know what, fuck it, okay. I love the moments where the characters are describing themselves in, like, the whole pulp summary thing. I'm the madcap reporter who will go any length to get my story. <laughs> Everything is just so wonderfully cheesy, and it really feels like this is the kind of movie that deserves... Warner Brothers is doing that whole disclaimer placard in front of the Looney Tunes cartoons that have all the blatant racism stuff where it's like, look, this was made in a time period where people didn't really think this through. This was not acceptable at the time, nor is it acceptable in any time, but this is the state of how culture was back then, and it would be doing a disservice to pretend it didn't exist, and so it will be shown in its entirety just for the sake of completeness. This is one of those movies where it feels like that would be beneficial to add those to, like, the DVDs and everything. But it's just so cheesy and happy and silly and fun. You could tell everybody on the movie was having such a great time making it that you can't help but love it yourself. And so that is why I wholeheartedly recommend this movie. I also wholeheartedly recommend it. I actually take issue with some of the criticism. But we will discuss it, because I actually find it a very subversive, almost satirical deconstruction of a lot of the stereotypes that it's kind of often accused of portraying. I find it actually a remarkably diverse portrayal of of Asian culture in Chinatown, and also just a very exciting film. The dialogue is just mile a minute, so Howard Hawksian. You can see this is like an early 60s Howard Hawks movie starring Tony Curtis. I think the action is great. I think the entire alley sequence like 20 minutes into the movie, is one of the best, one of the most perfect pieces of filmmaking Carpenter has ever done. I think it's beautifully shot. I think the score is fun. I think the cast is fun. I just find it a very lively romp. Romp's a good word for it. It's not even an action movie. I think that was probably why they had a hard time selling it. I mean, they didn't advertise this movie because they didn't know how to sell it. It's a fun comedy where a guy who thinks he's an action star just stumbles through something that isn't even his story. John Wayne drives his truck through a kung fu movie. Exactly. John Carpenter (laughs) in the commentary, him and Kurt Russell were like, yes, we are doing a John Wayne spoof. He is spoofing John Wayne deliberately. And you get that with the vocal mannerisms and everything. But yeah, oh man. Exactly. Even the swagger and everything. I think there was even a John Wayne movie that the whole knife in the boot thing came from. I think it is a remarkably well put together film. It is silly as hell, but I find it very cleverly silly. I mean, like one of the best moments is how the hell did you get up there? It wasn't easy. It's like that's all the exposition (laughs) you needed for that moment. And it's just so delightful. I find this to be a treat. I actually think this might be my favorite John Carpenter movie. 
which is saying a lot, given that we've had like three films in this decade where I've been like, this might be my favorite John Carpenter movie, so we'll see. I think it's mine as well. <laughs> Why don't we just get into the portrayal of Chinese culture? Because historically, when this film was first in production, it was attacked by the Asian community for going back and basically doing like an old Fu Manchu story. And he brought it to people within that community. He brought it to all the actors. Several of these actors are also producers on the movie. They also were all the location managers and choreographers and everything. And they worked through the script to make it as sensitive as it could be. And also portraying a diversity in Asian culture in terms of it's not all lumped together in this one thing. It's all just this whole mass of people that all are different personalities, different types. My thoughts are, I think I'm kind of too ignorant. Like, Julie and I were kind of trying to suss it out last night. And I'm just like, some of the statues, I'm like, is that Japanese? We just don't know enough about the culture to be able to say that they are misappropriating it or mishandling it. Since it takes a lighthearted, pulpy aspect, it does raise our awareness. I once asked a Chinese-Canadian friend of mine if this movie was racist, and his exact words were, shut up. So I've never really been able to figure this out myself. <laughs> In terms of like the Fu Manchu aspect, I think a lot of people in this day and age believe that the accusations against Fu Manchu being racist was because of Fu Manchu himself. It wasn't. The Sax Romer novels were entirely racist in that they literally portrayed the entirety of Asian culture as duplicitous and deceitful and crime ridden. And it's like literally being of Asian descent meant you will be a criminal. And anyone who is a criminal probably has some Asian in them. So there was this very Lovecraftian, let's just damn and condemn this thing that I don't understand. It's a nice analogy. His books, and I've read a couple of them, are awful. And the Fu Manchu character actually barely even appears in them. But it was just going near Asian culture in general was an awful, awful thing. And I think as the time has gone by, people have looked at those criticisms and just lumped them into, oh, well, the character of Fu Manchu is what everyone's complaining about. No, they were complaining about the entire novels as a whole. And the thing is, the character of Lo Pan here is a portrayal of what a classical royal dignitary slash sorcerer in Chinese lore would have looked like. And I actually love that they portray that image as basically a false front, and in reality, he's just this horny little old man cackling in a wheelchair. So there's even this kind of Wizard of Oz aspect to it. Also, I love that actor. Everything I've ever seen him in, he's always fantastic. He's true. Oh, James Hong, he's wonderful. Yeah. I think he's on Guinness for, like, most film credits, because he has, like, three or four hundred film credits. I've seen him constantly. And he's still alive. He's in his 80s, and he's still working. Oh, yeah, Kung Fu Panda. And he's got a very distinctive voice, he's, yeah. He's the goose, right? He's the goose, and he's Kung Fu Panda's dad. He was my favorite character in that movie. Speaking of his distinctive voice, if you've ever seen the original Godzilla, the one where they spliced in all the footage of Raymond Burr, mm -hmm. he voices half the characters in the English dub. Interesting. What I loved about Lo Pan is the central conflict here, it's not about Americans versus Asians like you would get in a lot of films of this type. It's not even Jack's story. It's about Lo Pan is, he's not even representing Asia, he's corporate. He is a CEO, he is a banker, him and the Storms are always walking around in pinstripe suits. And who are the heroes? The heroes are the blue-collar laborers, people who run the diner. Egg Shen is, he's a rich man, but he's a humble rich man. And so it's almost this kind of class struggle more than it is us versus them, Americans versus Asians. Like, there's even a bit there where, you know, they're drinking up the concoction and they all salute America because they American. are Americans yeah. and they're living in America. Mm -hmm. You know, but it's their culture within America. And I love that they said, you know, China is a mindset. It's in the heart. There was that whole thing earlier where they were discussing how could this pseudo-mythological character be in, where is this, California? Mm -hmm. San Fran. Wang's uncle, I think, that says China is here. It really kind of evoked a whole Neil Gaiman, American Gods kind of feel to it where your culture is wherever you set your roots, you bring mm -hmm. your home with you. And that's really what that felt like when it was doing that. It, it, I, I feel like I need to explain this. When I say it really feels like a racist kind of thing, it's one of those things where you look at it and you're like, I can't tell if I'm supposed to feel uncomfortable about this or not. Like Alex said, it's more out of personal ignorance than anything else. Like, it feels like it should be racist. If it's not, then, you know, more power to it. I don't know about you guys, but a lot of this stuff is just insane. Like, it's so ridiculous that it's like, they just chose China, they just chose a country, and then they inaugurated a whole bunch of, like, Asian-y type things, maybe. But it's all just so ridiculous and so layered and has this whole history that isn't really a history that it was just kind of, like, otherworldly. 
So I didn't really think it was like super angry against. I think it was, it was not like, a drop well, of heat in this. No, it was just silly. Thing, that part felt over the top, but so did every other aspect of the movie, which is why I was more okay with watching it than I probably would have otherwise been, even though you know, not knowing very much about any kind of actual cultural influences that it would have derived from, it was like it felt really over the top. But so did Jack, and so did all the, like, straight American people. And I should point out, this is actually built on the legends of traversing the levels of Chinese hell. The Bigfoot creature that runs around is a Chinese wild man who is a part of the lore. So is the eye creature. So it's like they actually did really bring a lot of stuff here. So are the three storms. And they built the story around researching the culture. But again, the original script was a period Western that was about Chinatowns being established along the railroad. And it was about how this culture is now first coming here and setting roots in America, as opposed to this movie where it's they've been here. They are here. That's where I wish I could find that original script just to see what that dynamic was like. Mm -hmm. It feels like there's a lot thrown around in there, but it's like if you stop and think about it, unlike, say, like Escape from New York, where when you stop and think about it, none of it holds together. There's a lot of stuff here where I stop and think about it. I'm like, okay, that actually does kind of build an interesting thing here and build that stuff there. And I think in terms of the portrayal of the ethnicities, there are a lot of elements in this film that had they been by themselves would have been completely stereotypical. You know, Egg Shen would have been the magic ethnic character. You know, Lo Pan. Wang, even Wang by himself. Even Wang by himself, yeah. This kid who happens to also be a kung fu master because he's Chinese. But by putting them all together, along with the broader confluence of things, like, because you have the gang wars, you have the fact that it's a multilingual area where some people speak English, some people don't. The fact that you get into the actual business side of Lo Pan. The fact that you have this character like Eddie, who isn't cultural, doesn't even study martial arts, he's very American and very, very yuppie-ish. You have this broad, diverse range of characters showing that it's not just this one thing that's being lumped together as this uniform thing. Valid points. With this further information, I feel like I should probably withdraw the this feels racist comment. No, that was your gut reaction, (laughs) man. That was my gut reaction while I was watching it. But again, that was all from personal ignorance. Well, it's also the 1980s film dealing with Asian culture. You can usually just assume correctly that it's going to be racist. And, I mean, all four of us are white and half American, half Canadian. By all means, listeners, if there are people out there who do have feelings on this, I would absolutely love to hear them. I would love to hear it as well, yes. I actually did look around and I was having a hard time finding any actual discussion of this film among the Asian community other than just the initial uproar when it came out. Mm -hmm. But that seemed to like die down as soon as the movie came out. I don't know if it's because they saw it, if it's because the film tanked and disappeared quickly. I don't know. I would be curious to learn more about that. Myself included, I find that this movie does not come from a place of hate, which is why I would never really fully accuse it of racism, but I could accuse it of cultural ignorance, but I don't know enough. I myself am ignorant, so that's why I'd like to hear from actual Chinese Canadian, Chinese American, or just Chinese uh, people would be wonderful just to know, just because I don't want to be that guy who's just like, let me tell you how it is. As a white person, I know exactly how this is going. (laughs) And it should also be said, it was written by a white guy, it was directed by a white guy. While they did bring in other people to consult on it, it's still by them as opposed to people who are within that community themselves. So that can absolutely affect how it turns out, too. Exactly. I don't want to be dismissive as well, because if there is racist or ignorant components of it, I'd like to be aware of that, just so that AI know for the future. (laughs) Have anything else you want to add about that before we roll into other aspects of the film? I'd like to get talking about the movie itself, because holy crap. Let's go ahead and bring up Jack Burton. Kurt Russell. (laughs) John Wayne. (laughs) The guy who thinks he's John Wayne. I haven't watched too many John Wayne films, so to me, he just came across as like a radio DJ (laughs) right off the back. (laughs) Listen to good old Jack. Well, a lot of it comes through in the vocal mannerisms and... uh, The swagger. The swagger, yeah. Yeah. When I saw this, like, what was it, 15 years ago? It was either my mom or my dad. I think it was my dad that said that he was playing John Wayne. That's really what stuck with me, is that it was John Wayne, literally and figuratively, driving his truck through this kung fu movie. I don't know, I just love this setup of, like, he just shows up with a haul of pigs, wins a bunch of money in a gambling thing, as opposed to how it usually go, where he'd lose a lot of money. Mm Mm-hmm. Then just starts following Wang around, gets embroiled in this whole thing, his truck is gone, what the fuck is going on? I love his reactions to things. Like, what was that? What is this? What is going on? It'll appear no more. What'll appear no more? (laughs) My favorite part of this, and I wish that they had kept this running joke going through the entire movie instead of having him be the one to finally defeat Lopan. 
I wish that they had kept it as him being passive throughout the entire movie. Like, I don't know if you've read Good Omens. Not yet. Without really spoiling it, the story is framed around the angel and the devil trying to stop the apocalypse. And it turns out that nothing they do actually does anything in the entire book. And that's both brilliant and also a very on-point discussion of a lot of the things that happens within the book at the same time. And it felt up until that very end moment with that final conflict that that's what Jack Burton was. He was passively going through this movie that was not his movie. This was not his story and just reacting to it. And that was brilliant. I loved every part of that. I just wish that they had done it the entire way. A Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead of action comedies. Yes, if you exactly. No, I agree with that completely. To me, it was Han Solo stumbling into Luke Skywalker's story, where Wang is Luke Skywalker, Jack is Han Solo, and he just kind of fumbles through it. And I agree with your points exactly. I just love that his bravado is never rewarded. Anytime he really steals himself up for a big moment, he's either knocked out or someone else kind of like upstages him. <laughs> he shoots the ceiling and... And the uh, rocks fall and knock him out. Exactly. I love the bit where it's like him and Wang are sitting there waiting for these guys to burst in. And he goes down, grabs his knife, accidentally throws it away. And by the time he retrieves it, Wang has taken everyone out. Exactly. <laughs> oh, that was the best. But I will say about the climax, I don't mind it because what I like is that Lopan has already lost. He had the massive duel with Egg Shen. Wang had the big fight with Rain, the giant sword fight where they're flying through the air and everything. Lopan being taken down by Jack Burton, having this natural born reflex to just catch things in midair. Which they set up all the way at the beginning of the movie. Exactly. So it wasn't out of nowhere. It wasn't out of nowhere. That's what I love. What's nice is that Jack beating him isn't a heroic victory. It's a punctuation and basically a splat in the face of just how far you've lost. Mm -hmm. It's an afterthought. It's like you're already dying. You're already falling. Here's a little salt in the wound. It's a killer moment, too. I mean, you cannot beat the, the knife catch and throw. <laughs> and then I also just love that Thunder gets so upset that he just blows up. Yeah, that's great. And then I love Lightning shows up with this badass moment where he's melting the ceiling. And then Egg Shen just drops a statue on his head. That's true. Now, Lightning looks so familiar, and I couldn't figure out what else I'd seen him in. Are these guys taken from... I swear, Shogun Assassin has three dudes that are almost exactly like this, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. And Raiden from Mortal Kombat was based on this movie. Oh, was he? But, like, that actor specifically... He's been in stuff. He still is in stuff. I wanted to say he was in uh, Ninja Turtles, one of those movies, but that may just be me being racist. I think so. one of the actors from Ninja Turtles was in this, but not one of the three storms. I can't remember what his name was. The guy's name starts with a T, the Shredder's right-hand man, if he was in the bad guy gang. Yeah, he was. I don't know if this guy was in the Ninja Turtles or not, but he is still a working actor. I know the guy who played Rain was a model. That's why you don't really see him do much in the way of martial arts. And Thunder was actually an A-list star in Hong Kong cinema since the early 70s. I know him. I've seen him. He's been in a ton of movies in Hong Kong. This is one of his few American ones. There was also another gentleman who was in a, like every action film between the mid 80s and early. The mullet guy? He's a big mustache. The mullet guy with the beard? Yeah, mullet guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was in Die Hard. He was in um, Commando. Yep. He's still in a ton. That's because he's a stunt coordinator, too. He's the stunt coordinator on tons of American movies and does the fight choreographer tons of American movies and he usually appears in all of them, too. Okay. He's awesome. Yes. What I also love about Jack Burton is Kurt Russell is not afraid to look like a complete buffoon. Like, I love the character that he puts on when he's at the brothel. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Nerdy white guy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Skeevy Clark Kent. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, that was great where he said he was basically doing a parody of a character he played in a Disney film. And John Carpenter in the audio commentary is like, I have to admit to you, I've never seen computer war tennis shoes. <laughs> <laughs> the sting in Kurt Russell's reaction to that was just heartbreaking. <laughs> Maybe that's why they never worked together again, because you didn't watch Computer War Tennis. His heart was broken. Yeah, this is my favorite of Kurt Russell's John Carpenter roles, and possibly my favorite of his roles, except maybe Stuntman Mike from um, Death Proof. <laughs> and then I also love the moment where he kisses Gracie in the elevator, and then he just has lipstick all over his face for the next five minutes. Absolutely, I love that. Until she specifically cleans it off of him. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> One thing I love about everything in this movie, well, I mean, there's tons of things I love, but I love that every character knows each other. They're just like, oh man, yeah. Gracie Law is here. <laughs> except for Jack, and Jack doesn't know anybody. <laughs> 
<laughs> like, first off, who are you? And how do you know you? And how do you know you? He knows Wang. Wang is someone that he yeah. has known. Yeah. I, I, I every that, time, everybody so else. many characters. Like Margot, I'm like, who the hell's this? I forget every time she's in this movie. But I think that's because I don't think they clearly established it. Wang is also a driver. So they know each other from the road. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Because there's Mar, there's Eddie. We know is the maitre d at Wang's restaurant at, at Uncle Shen. Yeah, Margo is looking for the big scoop because I always think that Gracie Law should be the reporter, but she's a lawyer. I think she's a lawyer who it doesn't do any lawyering. I can't remember if this was a line that was just in the script or if it was kind of buried in dialogue. But she was born in China. Gracie Law was. Yeah, Gracie Law. She's a white person, but she was born in China. It wasn't in the dialogue because I had the subtitles on and I never caught that. Then that might have just been a cut line. I did read the script, which is pretty much the shooting script and what they went with, except for just a few bits. That, I think, might be one of the bits that was cut out. Because she came over here as an orphan, too, so she knows what it's like, and that's why she's against human trafficking. I see. Was she born in China? Because that would make more sense. And that's why she qualifies as a second wife, because she's Chinese born with green eyes. That makes sense, then. The way Lopan was reacting was that she was a nice bonus. Oh my god, I love Lopin. He's like one of the few villains that just goes with the flow. And he's just like, oh, so this is happening. Great. <laughs> I'm going to turn it to my advantage. I'm going to kill this girl. Marry this girl. <laughs> I love that he's just a creepy old guy who's just tired of being alone. He's going about it the wrong way. He's going about it the very wrong, the wrongest way you could go about it. <laughs> he's just such a sad, pathetic guy. And that's what I love about in terms of like the portrayal of Fu Manchu is he's not being portrayed as this horrible, evil monster. He's just this really creepy, sad old guy that you just want him to be like, eh, just go away. <laughs> <laughs> He just hasn't been able to let go for 2,000 years. And I just love these things that James Hong does, like with these kind of little squeals that he does. Oh, his mannerisms are amazing. I love that bit where he's doing the sorcerer battle and he's just trying to waggle his thumbs. Yeah, yeah. He's... Yeah, like, like he's playing a video game or something. Yeah. <laughs> I, he's just so into that role. He's having the most fun out of an entire cast that is having a lot of fun. Yeah. It really looks like everybody was having the time of their life there, and it really shows. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When we talk about Dennis Dunn as Wang Chi. Oh, he's great. Oh, he was great. Yep. I love, I love that they had a character named Wang, and they did not once ever feel the need to make a dick joke. Yeah, uh, yeah. Not once, because in every other film in America featuring an Asian character named Wang, they do that. <clears throat> Pretty pink. <clears throat> yes. And that's Long Duck Dong. Yeah, from 16 Candles, yeah. 16 Candles, sorry. But I mean, even Balls of Fury, that had James Ong, yeah. <laughs> oh, they are, yeah, they're still doing that, yeah. If yeah. we haven't gotten through that. In the television show, Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, they completely reversed that, where there's a character, I can't remember his name, is it might be Dong. His name's Dong, and he goes, oh, Kimmy, in Korean, that means penis. Because she was about to make that joke, and they, she had it turned right around on her. <laughs> it was beautiful. Yep. I like that he is a character who has his own complete journey. I love the thing that they did. And this was something that was something that they changed from the shooting script. Jack was more involved in a lot of the action scenes and all that stuff. I love how it is Wang's movie. Mm -hmm. Wang is the hero of this movie. It is his story. He is fighting the villain. He is saving the one that he loves. He's surrounded by all of his friends. And Jack doesn't realize that he's just part of the ensemble. It's true. And they completely sidestep another mistake, which is to make Wang too noble or boring. He's funny. He's fallible. He's just a good character. I mean, it opens with him losing 2000 bucks to Jack in gambling debt. Yeah. He makes it like this whole thing about honor at the end. He's just like, oh, well, worked at home. <laughs> yeah. That's what I also love is that there's no, as over the top fantastical as this movie is, there's no, like, falseness to it in terms of, like, nobility and meaning and morality and pride. It's people just doing what they got to do. Yep. And, you know, sometimes they make bad choices. Sometimes, I mean, like, I even love the bit where Jack shoots somebody and the guy goes, is this the first time you plugged a guy? And the way that Jack says, of course not, means that, yes, it was. Absolutely. There's so many little details like that. Like, the door opens automatically. Like, is, did you do that? And Wang is like, uh, uh, sure. uh yeah, I, I guess so. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. Just little moments like that. The dialogue is like, on this viewing, even more so than any other viewing when I was more paying attention, the dialogue is just crackling. Everyone's got something to say. Like, one person's like, oh, I must be monumentally naive. And Eddie's like, yeah, you are. <laughs> I love that. And again, that's where it had this kind of classical Howard Hawksian feel to it. Of like, you could stick that on a film in the 40s and you could imagine someone saying that. Yeah, when we dissected the thing from another world, I can now see exactly what you're saying. Oh, yeah. 
I think this is the closest. I mean, Carpenter loved Hawks. He emulated Hawks like crazy. I think this is the closest he ever got to capturing that energy and that vibe and that style of Hawks. Mm-hmm. And yeah, there's just that the lawyer is named Gracie Law. Yep. Who are you? I'm Gracie Law, lawyer. That's why I say it's just like super pulpy. <laughs> I loved Gracie Law. I love Kim Cattrall as Gracie. Oh, she's wonderful. Wonderful. She was great, yeah. Again, played over the top, but exactly the same amount that everybody else was. I even loved very staged moments, like where they're in the sewer tunnel, and she's like, where's Eddie? And she pulls up Eddie. Where's Margaret? Pulls up Margaret. Where's Jack? Pulls up Jack. (laughs) Back to your point for a second there. This is like the most blue-collar fantasy film since Alien. (laughs) And that's what I said. It's about the blue-collar, you know, salt-of-the-earth laboring types versus the corporate CEO. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. It seemed to me like Goonies for adults. I agree with that. Yeah. It really does have kind of a Goonies feel, doesn't it? Like they're going underground, they're going through tunnels, there's traps. And then, like, even at the end, when they have to chase the bad guys literally through a skull, and, like, they're doing all the underwater stuff, and they're all trying to save it against this big corporation, and they're all, like, the underdogs, and they're a band of misfits all together (laughs) that wouldn't normally hang out together. It's good. Super cartoony in all the best ways, especially I love the neon outline of all the statuary in the marriage hall. I would design my house to look like the marriage hall, to be and, honest. And <laughs> just all very 80s neon, but it really played up the cartoonishness. Half the budget was spent on fake cobwebs, I think. I'm just distracted <laughs> by imagining Kurt Russell running around with Chunk fighting pirates. That would be so great. I'm pretty sure it'd be seamless, Noel. I think you could make a super cut. <laughs> oh, Yeah. <laughs> And then, yeah, I love you have the old world, new world. It feels like a modern film, and yet there's so much ancient culture there being viewed through modern eyes. Mm -hmm. You know, yes, the underground ceremony has neon lights and an escalator alongside all of this massive statuary. The sets are sumptuous. I love them. (laughs) Oh, I loved how there were these glorious tracking shots where you would just follow people running the entire length of each set, just showing, letting Mm -hmm. you see the entire set. Oh, I love the way this movie shot. Yeah, absolutely. They walk from one set piece and then back to the set piece where the fight's still going on, which means the actors were still performing their stunts and everything. God, yes, that alley scene where they just circle around the entire area. God, I love the alley scene. It just builds so well. And it's very still Carpenter-esque because it does have shades of Escape from New York where they run down into the basement, have a moment to talk, and then suddenly the door's kicked in and then they have to go to the next set piece where they kind of burst out through the little tunnels and it's just wonderful. All of that fight is happening while Kurt Russell is just sitting in the truck going, what the hell is going on? Mm-hmm. Like all, like this whole big gang culture war with all this big drama and you could tell that there's this whole big history there and he's just sitting there going, What? What is this? Who's Stop that? shooting at my truck. Yes. <laughs> he's very much the ugly American. And I love how he, he's just like, fuck it, I'm just going to drive through. And the three storms are just like glaring at him as they just go around him. And then Lopan is there. And I love Lopan is literally even just waggling his finger. Come on, come on, bring it, come on. <laughs> and then just that effect that they do with Lopan with the glowing eyes and the glowing mouth. That is so iconic, Carpenter. Yeah, the glowing eyes, the lightning effects, everything looks wonderful. Whenever you'd have that green ripple of energy. Yeah, absolutely. Which, very reminiscent of from the last time that I watched Prince of Darkness, mm-hmm. which you guys will get to at some point. We'll be getting to next month. Also starring, um, what's his face? Yep, Victor Wong. Yes. And Dennis Dunn, who plays Wang Chi, also is in that movie, too. Hmm. I look forward to watching it for the first time. <laughs> Now, one of the interesting observations that I had, and Kevin, you weren't on that for that episode, but you won't get it. Alex and Julia, Black Moon Rising was a story about the heroes losing a vehicle. Mm -hmm. Their first attempt to recover said vehicle doesn't go well. So then they hook up with an expert, break into the massive underground complex, and in the last 10 minutes, recover the vehicle. It's just an interesting, weird parallel, especially compared to the original Carpenter script of Black Moon Rising. It's like you could lay these scripts on top of each other, and there's very similar story mechanics going on. It's It's very true. It's very true. A lot of Carpenter films are very, like, point A to point B, then to point C, then back to point A kind of films. Yeah. (laughs) It's like a Skrillex album. All the songs are exactly the same beats. Do you know what John Carpenter hates, guys? Skrillex? No. Do you know what John Carpenter hates? What? What? Um, costume changes. 
That's true. Yeah. Everyone's always wearing the same thing all the time. <laughs> everyone is like a 90s cartoon. They just have one outfit. Everyone, it's true. Yeah, everyone always has a uniform. Like April and Eel in her yellow jumpsuit. When I saw him, when he took off that poncho when he went through the thing and he had that t-shirt and he had the full outfit, I'm like, how many meetings did they have about that t-shirt? I'm like, at least three meetings were had about that t-shirt. <laughs> And then I love he goes into the variant figure of nerdy white guy and then goes right back to T-shirt. Yep. That's true. Well, <laughs> back in a uniform. So now he has a jean jacket, but then he loses the jean jacket and is right back to the T-shirt. Well, to be fair, doesn't this all take place over the course of like one day? Yeah, yeah but yeah. lots of John Carpenter's take place in that kind of linear storyline. Like they all have the same outfit. It all kind of real time like goes through that. It's very like a play type of thing. I kind of like that because it allows a character to have such a signature look. It's a definite, that's who that is, that's who that is. Let's do this. Exactly. John stylized Carpenter. <laughs> the John Carpenter fashion line. I actually think that would sell, guys. I think you should cut that out. Oh, I think Patent you can bring half of that yeah, back. Yeah. It's who you'll always ever be. Camo tights, camo tights. They're due for a comeback. I think we'll see how that goes in Escape from L.A. where he digs out that outfit after 15 years. <laughs> I really liked when they beat the guy at the end and all of his golden statues fell over and they were all just plaster. <laughs> but they were just watching it go. Yeah. yeah. This whole minute dunk, long dunk, cascade dunk, of the, they just stopped and watched it. <laughs> That in itself was amazing, the domino shot. I just appreciated the fact that they weren't made out of gold. It was just spray-painted plaster. You know, his business brought in low returns that year. Yeah. <laughs> he spent all that money on the neon track lighting. It's like he priced out that <laughs> throne room, and he had to make some cuts. <laughs> you know, feeding a beholder is actually really expensive. Actually, something that I just realized is that for a film of this type, especially if we're bringing up Fu Manchu, they never once got into opium or opium dens. That's true. Which would usually be what the bad guy's doing. Mm-hmm. No, he's just involved in human sexual trafficking. <laughs> <laughs> no biggie. Well, he's a banker. Wasn't that his public front was that he was a banker? He's a banker. What I like about the trafficking angle, which is, I shouldn't use like about that. <laughs> What you appreciated in this movie context. What I like is, you know, if they had gone the opium den route, that would have been the typical stereotypical villain thing to go. This is more an issue that is more of a broader worldwide issue and is not just identifiable to one culture. Yeah, I like that. Mm -hmm. And it also deals with the issue of immigrants. You know, people come over here with hopes and dreams and get caught up in trafficking systems. You know, which we see Gracie fighting right from the first moment we see her. Was Lopan involved in the human trafficking? I think he had just abducted oh, yeah. the two because the human trafficking they burst into and stole her from. That was a separate operation. No, but remember all the women in cages that they free from his compound? Oh, did they? They also specified that those street thugs were a branch of that greater gang. Okay. But they stole her for their own reasons, but then when word of the green-eyed Chinese woman went up to Lopan, he's like, I want her. Okay. But yeah, then there is that broader thing where when they're breaking in underground and there's that bit where Kim Cattrall is bound up in a kind of bondage fashion, that's where it's all cages full of women who are being trafficked, that they all break free. Roger that. And just to clarify, they're stealing these women by grabbing them as they walk off the plane at the airport? Surrounded by people, even with people who can identify them standing there. Yes. Yeah, that is not well thought out of human trafficking. Oh, <laughs> oh pre-9-11 America. <laughs> Although I did like the guy that showed up in, like, the Inuit glasses, the Inuit sunshield glasses, like, looking all boss. Like the glare reducer glasses? Yeah. yeah. That was pretty cool. Well, that's 80s gangs in a nutshell. They all kind of wore that. Like, if they weren't wearing something like that, it was, like, 3D glasses and a mohawk. Basically the entire cast of Back to the Future 2. Yeah, pretty much, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> One thing that I was surprised to learn was I had always been of the assumption that the character of Miao Yin mm -hmm. was a Caucasian woman made up to look Asian because they needed someone with green eyes. That's what I thought. She's Susie Pai. She's from Ohio, but she is of mixed ethnicity. Her father is Asian, so she is not wearing any makeup. That's her own hair and everything. She just has light brown eyes, and they needed someone with light eyes just so the contacts would stand out. And Kim Cattrall is even wearing contacts, too. She does have green eyes, but they just aren't that vibrant. I saw that this time. Before, I was just like, oh, yeah, they made a white woman out to be Asian. This time I watched it on, like, a much better resolution. And, and I'm just like, oh, I think she might be biracial. Yeah, so that was neat to actually look that up. But you could see in the, when they do those extreme close-ups of the eyes, oh, yeah, there's contact. It's too bad that she's just such a non-entity as a character, though, because they have Kim Cattrall and even Margot's tits yeah. that, like, Meow doesn't even struggle. Like, at the yeah. airport, it's just, okay, yeah. and then she's just flying in the back of the car, like, I guess this is happening. 
like no dialogue at all, just mainly unconscious. Yeah. And Susie Pye, her career comes from being a penthouse pet, uh, which basically led her to a string of movies where she's the Asian woman who has a love scene with the hero. Uh, and this was like one of her last things. She kind of disappeared for a while. Yeah, she was given kind of short shrift. She is. And I think that's kind of why they put Kim Cattrall in there with her, just so you have something a little more going on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Kim Cattrall's yeah. great. And Margot, too. They're both very good characters. That Maybe that explains why Margot exists, though, because Meow has... She is non-existent, and that way there's, like, two women that are actually have good characters. Mm -hmm. Because Margot doesn't really do anything. Margot doesn't really do anything, but she's just a fun character to bounce off of. She's just neat, but Meow doesn't do anything either, but she's not talking, so someone has to. Well, I also like, Margot is like Jack in that she's also the outsider. So mm-hmm. she's the person to bounce off of in terms of like, what does that mean? Explain this to me. Mm-hmm. I just like that she's irritated throughout the whole movie. <laughs> everything seems very inconvenient to her. <laughs> I'm just going to do everything I possibly can to get my scoop. And I like that her and Eddie had a thing. Yeah, no, it was cute. I like that she's also the instigator, too. Yes. Where she's just like, yeah, let's meet over at my house. Wink. <laughs> He did have lots of women in his army, though. Like, there was a fight scene where they just... Uh, they, the guards. The guards were all women. Or specifically the guards of the women's prison, yeah. Yeah, there was women in his little entourage there, too, which was kind of cool. Mm-hmm. And that's what I loved is Eddie and Wing show up, the two women appear, and the women completely kick their ass before they're finally able to then overcome them, but still. Yeah, that was great. I love how they pull the guns and the women just knock the guns right out of their hands and shoot tear gas in their face. <laughs> that was hilarious. Positive attitude elevator was my favorite. Oh, yes, yes. You mean the scene where they're all in the elevator and they're just kind of patting themselves on the back, feeling good about the potion positive they just took? Positive vibes. Yeah, yeah. they're a really positive attitude about really this. Positive attitude about <laughs> this. <laughs> yeah, that was one of my favorites. I laughed out loud at that and my favorite line in the entire film. Son of a bitch must pay. <laughs> <laughs> I love the little beholder thing was one of those things that when I saw Uh, this as a child gave me nightmares. Yeah, it would do that for sure. Specifically that bit where its tongue sticks out. And then when I later discovered Beholders and Dungeons and Dragons, I thought that there was some connection between them and this. I thought that's where that came from. But it's actually like a mythological thing? The original mythical thing is it's just like a ball with eyes on it. This one, they gave it a face. They gave it that weird personality. I think they're in Final Fantasy as well. Yeah, I mean, like, the other creature they find is a Chinese wild man, which is basically the Chinese version of Sasquatch. Their interpretations of some of them are a little wild. And I should say, I always thought that Rob Bottin, who did the Creature Effects for Thing, came back for this. He didn't. What it was was his team that worked with him on the thing came back and one of them was promoted into the lead. Okay. So it is still a lot of the same people who worked on the thing, just not the head person. And then I also had nightmares when Thunder, of course, inflates into his massive balloon self. Yeah, if you saw it really early. If you're five and don't know what the hell's going on. Oh, yeah. What just happened? I had nightmares from Fraggle Rock when I was five, so. (laughs) And then, of course, my dad decided to play along with it. That's why you don't hold your breath too long. (laughs) What I love is that that was even not out of the blue, because that was how he threw Jack off of him in the circle prison, Mm -hmm. was by doing that. That completely set that up. And speaking of, I love the bit with Jack in the wheelchair. Mm -hmm. Oh, God, that was great. Especially the bit where he has to pull himself back up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. There's him going screaming backwards down the entire corridor. Oh, my God. (laughs) See, that might be my favorite piece of John Carpenter camera work. God, I love the camera work. Even when the um, gang members kidnap Malin at the airport, you just have those great slick shots of them in the car. Two shots, them in the car speeding away, Yalin tucked in the trunk. It's just beautifully shot, just those two quick things. And that music video that he just recently put out is basically that sequence, just done as a music video. God, it's just such a slick movie. We'll get into it next month, but I know this is the last that we're really going to get of that for a while. Because this is the last film he made with that cinematographer, and the guy that's coming up is not someone that I care for as much. And that's the guy who's going to do every single John Carpenter film for the remainder of his career. Yeah. And I think it's going to show. I mean, Dean Cundy, you know, Halloween, Escape from New York, The Fog. That's been a killer team. You know, even did Halloween's two and three. And it's kind of sad that they never again reunited after this. That is sad. I mean, as I said, Dean Cundy then went off and became the DP for Spielberg and Ron Howard and did Apollo 13 and Jurassic Park and Who Framed Roger Rabbit. So it's like you can't begrudge the guy for being busy. No. But from the late 90s on, he's been doing like Garfield and stuff like that. <laughs> so it's like, maybe come back. I don't know. <laughs> 
Just a little side note to add is we've talked in the past about why John Carpenter has kind of retired in the last few years. I just recently learned why, and I just figure I might as well share it here if that's okay. Go ahead. He's basically blind. Oh, wow. The retinas in both of his eyes tore. He's had numerous surgeries. He can see, but he just has an extremely limited field of vision. He can't read anymore. He can't really look at stuff in the distance anymore. So that's kind of why he's retired. He can't really see. That's really sad. I think he's just going to enjoy his retirement. I don't think we're going to get another Carpenter film past the work. If we do, we'll cover it here. But that's kind of why he's been focusing on other projects. Keep it busy. Comic writing and... uh... The comic writing, the music. Yeah. And even then, that's largely him just kind of signing off on things other people are doing. Which, you know, hey, he's had his career. Hey, yeah. He's got quite the legacy. But yeah, and it's just to have that great eye. And that this is one of the big blows to, I think, Carpenter's style is losing the people who helped emphasize that style. Mm-hmm. I really seriously, I, I'm kind of dreading going back to Prince of Darkness in the context of this broader career because my memories of it is it's going to be a big step down. And every other film since is going to be a pretty big step down. I'm holding out hope for a couple of the films. Anyways, we're kind of diverting a bit. Uh, you are and, not selling it, no. <laughs> I know I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Lie to me a little bit. Oh, I think <laughs> In the Mouth of Madness is going to be a fascinating thriller that'll grip you on the edge of your seat. I'm interested. Let's do this. I like how it's shot like an 80s movie, but it was made in the 90s. Save it for that episode, which you're not going to be on. I'm not going to be on, so I'm saying it now. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, any final thoughts that we have for Big Trouble in Little China? Son of a bitch must pay. I love this movie. I love it. I, I was a bit more critical this time, but I implicitly love this movie. It is probably my favorite Carpenter film and one of my favorite films of all time. I will say, I don't think it's his best movie, but by God, I don't know that there's going to be another one that I like as much as this. Even ones that we've gone through. You know, I think it's his most fun movie. Yes. Because everything else, like... like It's joyous. Salt on Precinct 13 is not a fun movie, but is such an artistically beautiful movie. It actually is really fun at times, though. Well, no, but I mean, Remember like... when they're playing potatoes? <laughs> you know what I mean. But, uh... Yes. Uh, but this one is just so <laughs> unabashedly, like you said at the beginning, Romp is probably the best description of this movie. And so iconic, too. Like, you will find people that quote this movie, even without even realizing that they're quoting it, because it just pervaded the public consciousness. Certain lines, certain scenes, certain everything that you keep seeing pop up again and again and again, they're all from this movie. It's such a fun movie. Oh, my God. I'm just going to keep saying that over and over again, so move on. <laughs> and I love how consistent it is in tone. What I love is that, yes, it's a big, silly movie that they're having a blast doing, but it never feels like they just get lost in the silliness and just be stupid. It's a movie that feels also like they're hugely committed to. They are committed to just doing the best they can while having as much fun as they can. I seriously, I don't think there's another Carpenter movie that I enjoy as much as I do. Even The Thing, even The Thing, which for like over a decade has been my favorite Carpenter movie of all time. I think this takes the top spot for me in terms of favorite. Again, I don't think it's his best, but in terms of my favorite, my God, is it a pleasant experience. Mm -hmm. No, I'm always a big fan of the separation of favorite and best. Like, to bring up Superman, Superman 2's my favorite, Superman's the best. It's just how it goes. Yeah, you're right. Everything, every line of dialogue is sold. It is sold to you because it is sold with fun and conviction. And it's just a wonderful movie. Julia, your thoughts on the spot. I liked it. You heard it here first. (laughs) I did. I really liked it. I didn't think I was going to at all. Something clicked over in my mind and I just relaxed a little bit and I let it take me on a ride and I liked it a lot. Major marriage victory right here, folks. (laughs) And overall, what do you think you're going to take away from that? I think it means that I might be growing up. No, I think it might be happening. (laughs) (laughs) Say it isn't so. (laughs) It's a definite part of growing up where you just kind of let things go. And you're just kind of like, maybe I don't have to be a giant bitch about this. Or maybe I don't have to think the same way I always thought. Or maybe I don't have to look at things the way I've always thought. I just found something about You don't have to about, die like, on that hill. Yeah. Like, sometimes you can just fucking let go and just maybe look at something differently and experience it through someone else's eyes. Because I watched that movie through Alex's eyes this time, and it was wonderful. There's something that's really liberating about that, isn't there? Just being like, yeah, I like that. Shut up. And also, how much do you think it also ties into now that you've had the broader context of John Carpenter? Oh, of course, because there's all those touchstones through there that I would never have picked up on otherwise. So that's a definite, definite plus. Yeah. And that's something where I would say that I think I've kind of noticed where the people who really like this movie are people who are also broader Carpenter fans. 
Whereas people who dislike the movie are people who haven't really watched any Carpenter. So I think there's such pure Carpenterness to this that it's almost a hard movie to introduce people through. I would never have this be someone's first Carpenter film, but when you've got a couple under your belt, this is now your dessert. It's like nobody else could have made this movie. Yeah. Which is going to make it really interesting because I just pulled it up on IMDb and I found out that they're remaking it with Dwayne The Rock Johnson. I'm all for a remake. I'm curious to see what they do with it. I actually really like the writers on that. Zach Stenson and Ashley Over Miller. Really good pair of writers. Yeah, it could go horribly. This is a film that would be very hard to do, but I could see someone taking the ideas of it and doing something different with it. The Rock can sell the shit out of it, though. He's awesome. And what's great about Dwayne is that, like Kurt Russell, he's not afraid to let himself look like a buffoon. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. He's not afraid to be silly and have fun. There's um, one of those Star Wars books that are now declared non-canon by Disney. It has a great quote where it, you can't look dignified while you're having fun, and Dwayne The Rock Johnson just epitomizes that. Yeah. I mean, the guy was a tooth fairy. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think that is perfect casting. And I know there was this initial uproar when they said that John Carpenter's not going to be involved, which John Carpenter came out and said, why would I be? It wasn't my movie. It was a Fox movie that they hired me on. So Dwayne came out and said, I'm going to make this happen. I'm going to try to get John involved. And John is like, OK, just pay me enough. I'm fine. And then people took outrage at that, despite the fact that that's what Carpenter <laughs> says all the time. When it comes to any of the movies that he wrote and he didn't direct, when they asked him, did he like it or not? He's like, oh, it depends on how much they paid me for that. What I love about Carpenter's viewpoint is he doesn't give a shit if people remake the films because there's actually a bit on the commentary where he talks about when he parted ways with W.D. Richter on the script because W.D. Richter had just made his directorial debut and he was actually approaching this film hoping to direct. They ultimately, you know, when the film was finished and was done, W.D. Richter went and saw it, came and talked to Carpenter, said, you did a good job with it. And Carpenter brought up the time when he went and saw Eyes of Laura Mars for the first time. And that was the first time that he wrote something and then lost control over it. While he was sitting there watching it, he was like, there's so much here that I wouldn't have done, but I'm not bothered by that because now I know what it's like to go out there and make a movie and all the choices that you have to make, all the problems that you come across, all the decisions that are involved in the process. It's their movie and it's allowed to be their movie. It's allowed to not be my movie. So he doesn't care about remakes. He doesn't care about other people adapting his work or doing sequels. So long as they're good. Again, he doesn't even care if it's bad. It's just, it's not his movie. He'll never say if you like something or hate something when he's involved with it in that way. He'll just say, it wasn't mine, I didn't make it. Which is it's just this interesting kind of weird philosophy he has that I admire. Mm -hmm. Sounds like John Carpenter grew up too. I think people get a little too attached to, like, he's the only person who can ever make this. No, he's, he's not. He's the only person who can make it the way he does. But that doesn't mean that other people can't make it in interesting ways. So I'm curious to see how the Big Trouble turns out. I still need to read the comics that they've done in the last couple of years. I will be checking those out at some point, as well as the unproduced TV movie sequel that almost got made in the 90s called More Big Trouble in Little China, which was written by Peter David, the comic writer and Star Trek novelist, as well as Chip Prozer, who wrote Inner Space, hmm. before it was rewritten by a much better writer. I will be covering those in upcoming bonus episodes at some point whenever I get done with all the thick ones that I've been sitting on. So I think that's all I have to say about Big Trouble in Little China. I think I'm done, too. I think I'm out. Likewise. I concur. Thank you for listening to another episode of Masters of Carpentry. We bid you good evening and look forward to seeing you for the next episode where you will pay. Masters of Carpentry can be found at mastersofcarpentry.blogspot.com and is in no way affiliated with John Carpenter or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. Our theme music is Black Rainbow by Jack Locke. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. <laughs>